Good morning, Paul, and uh, good morning, everyone else. So thank you very much for that introduction. So uh, I am I, Stephanie Boyce, the president of the Law Society of England and Wales. And for those less familiar with the Law Society, we are the representative body for over 200,000 solicitors in England and Wales. And our purpose is to be the voice of solicitors, to drive excellence in the profession and to promote and safeguard the rule of law nationally and internationally. And lawyers play a fundamental role in addressing gender inequality. And they do this through providing their expertise to parliamentarians and government, shaping and influencing legislation through representing clients in inequality cases and through contributing to practice guidance and policies within the legal profession and as fair and inclusive employers. Since the beginning of my tenure as president of the Law Society, I have made it my primary goal to help to build the open, diverse and inclusive legal profession of the future. And while we have come some way in pursuit of a diverse and inclusive legal sector, there is a lot more to be done if we are to achieve what we are aiming for, a legal profession that truly reflects the society it serves. And because lawyers have such a wide ranging impact across society, having a diverse profession will have a positive impact on diversity beyond our sector. And the work starts within the sector, but its effects will be felt throughout society. And there is work that needs to be done to improve the gender equality of the profession, not just in the UK, but worldwide. In November 2020, the Global Compact and Forum for SDG 16 was launched and has been operational since. And the Compact and Forum was created to help to help achieve two aims, or two of the UN's key priorities among its sustainable development goals. And that is promoting the rule of law and increasing access to justice. And the Law Society is honored to be a founding member together with the Inter-American Bar Association, the Paris Bar, the French Bar, and the World Bank supported by CMS and to collaborate with our other partners. Through the Law Society's International Women in Law Program that was operational from 2017 until the beginning of 2022, we aim to increase the level of gender equality in the legal sector worldwide. We carried out research and published reports to start building a picture of the existing gender inequality in the legal sector in order to adopt the right measures to promote entry into the profession and career progression for women in law, free from discrimination, unconscious bias and exclusion. Our report advocating for change, transforming the legal profession through gender equality was published in June 2019. And one of the main challenges that the report highlighted was the lack of data, both qualitative and quantitative, demonstrating the importance of gender equality in the legal profession. It also showed the need to improve gender equality at senior level and in leadership positions. So while a global issue, the particular factors affecting gender disparity and the barriers facing women in the legal sector will be influenced by different cultures in various countries. And that is why the Law Society also published a series of country focused research reports with the support of local stakeholders, including law societies, bar associations, law firms, in-house counsel and individual lawyers. We have now shared that knowledge with our partners through the Global Compact and Forum. So change has not been and will not be easy or quick, but we have a responsibility to identify challenges and try to address them now so that the international legal profession of tomorrow can be more supportive, welcoming of female lawyers everywhere. And I hope too that male colleagues and allies will join me in taking up this challenge. They have an integral role to play in driving change using their positions and networks to take progress to every corner of the profession. And I know that we can all work together as one united community of legal professionals through events such as today's 
to build the open and inclusive legal profession we all want to see. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Boyce. So now I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Julie Coutier, who is the president of the Bar uh, Paris Bar Association. Ms. Coutier? Yes. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, nice to see you all there, uh, in, in spite of, the, of our technical problems, but we finally managed it. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, fellow, fellow lawyers and dear colleagues, um, in 2021, uh, 113 women died in France from domestic violence. This means that concretely, there is more than one victim for every three days. This terrible figure reveals the difficulty we have in protecting women who are victims of daily violence. Of course, the subject is, an, is on the political agenda. Uh, equality between women and men was one of the big causes of Emmanuel Macron's first five-year term. And the recent appointment of Isabel Rome as deputy minister in charge of equality between women and men sends an interesting message. She is a magistrate who has been active for many years and was appointed in 2018 as senior official for gender equality at the Ministry of Justice. In particular, we owe her in part for the creation of a probationary court surveillance of spouses accused of domestic violence. This, in a way, is the big picture. In short, in France, equality between women and men has never been so high on the political agenda. And yet, it is clear that we still have a long way to go to achieve equality between the sexes and more broadly to ensure that all women can enjoy their freedoms. The question of freedom is, in my opinion, directly linked to the question of awareness. That is to say, the capacity for rich and everyone, regardless of their social origin, their level of study, their economic situation, to have, to all, to have access to all existing protection systems. What we see in Paris is that we are still far off the mark. The, there remains institutional violence that excludes a part of the female public from accessing the law. Fighting against this is one of the missions of the Access to Law Department of the Paris Bar. Today, we train our lawyers to that they are able to welcome all audiences in adapted conditions. Our goal is to provide tailor-made information and therefore the right protection. As such, mm -hmm. we have set up a list of lawyers designated for legal aid who are specially trained uh, on issues of domestic violence Thanks to the system, a victim will be able to have one dedicated lawyer who is appointed to take charge of all procedures concerning her situation. Lawyers specializing in violence against women also provide on-call legal consultations within various Parisian structures, and in particular, our Bus de la Solidarité, which parks at specific locations throughout the city. These systems, which are open to everyone, regardless of their administrative or economic situations, to consult a lawyer free of charge and in a place that is easier to access than an institutional structure or a law firm. I know that we are not the only ones to consider that awareness to existing protective measures is one of the keys of equality. It is with this ambition that the Paris Bar is currently coordinating a working group uh, on access to law within the framework of the World Bank Impact and Forum. Uh, Stephanie just talked uh, about that, dubbed uh, the Lawyers Cookbook on Access to Law and Justice. Its purpose is to bring together professionals uh, in access to law and produce a practical guide, the famous cookbook, uh, listing the best initiatives around the world that allow vulnerable categories of people to know and defend their rights. We are convinced that this initiative can make it possible to reduce the abstention of taking recourse to legal remedies in all our countries. This is indeed one of the major challenges of the years to come, to let audiences, even and especially the most vulnerable, know that they too have rights to assert. In this regard, I want to recognize and thank the World Bank, as well as the members of the working group already on board, and in particular the American Bar Association and the Inter-American Bar Association, and I invite all those who wish to join in our work. It is an ambitious program that can really change the situation. Finally, and I will end here, equality between, between women and men is also and above all an economic struggle. 
I have made equality within the profession a priority of my mandate. We cannot simply facilitate access to the law. We must also examine ourselves. And our profession is also where the shoe pinches. I continue to receive a significant number of reports of sexual harassment, moral harassment and discrimination. To, find, to, to, to fight against them, I have reinforced the means of our commission which fights against them. And because maternity leaves remain one of the obstacles to professional equality, I launched a mission on this subject. My goal is to provide my female counterparts with concrete solutions by the end of the year. As you will have understood for the Paris Bar, equality between women and men is a key subject because it determines the ability of women to exercise their freedoms, their rights. This battle has its place in, in our historic fight for the rule of law. We will never let go. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Couturier. Um, now I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Francisca Pretorius, who is the head of the civil and criminal justice reform at the Commonwealth uh, Secretariat. Francisca? Good morning, and thank you, Paul. It's an honor to be speaking with you all. Um, today, I will briefly touch on uh, how women have been affected as a result of the pandemic with regard to accessing law and justice. I will share a little bit of thoughts on justice reforms necessary to tackle this disparity and a bit of information on what the Commonwealth Secretariat has been doing to promote gender justice. But before delving into this, um, I, just a quick intro. So as Paul mentioned, I'm the head of the Office of Civil and Criminal Justice Reform, which is called a justice transformation for short in the Commonwealth because it's a bit of a long title. So um, the Commonwealth Secretariat, for those of you who don't know, is a voluntary association of 54 independent and equal countries. It's home to 2.5 billion people. So it's a lot of economies from advanced to de developing and 32 of our members are small states and many are island nations. Um, and as the head of the Office of Civil and Criminal Justice Reform, our goal, my goal is to transform the operation of justice systems and the delivery of justice across the Commonwealth by creating useful, impactful, agile and user-centered legal knowledge products, networks and platform. This is also that we can ensure equal access to justice for all. We're a cross-cutting team, so we help with creating these toolkits and, and um, platforms and networks from topics on anti-corruption to law and climate change, which really, as I say, the golden thread here is to improve access to justice. Okay, so to jump into those three things that I mentioned, how have women been affected as a result of the pandemic with regard to accessing law and justice? As we all here know, many factors found at every point of the justice chain can be obstacles to access to justice. So economic, political, social, cultural factors, all of these are present, they present specific obstacles to women and girls, and these factors all interact with each other in complex ways. So we know, we know we've heard today how women have been disproportionately affected during the pandemic specifically. And the data paints a very dire picture. It's estimated that 47 million women and girls have been pushed into extreme poverty since the start of the pandemic, bringing the total number of women, women living on less than $2 a day to 435 million. Globally, we all know that women do three quarters of all unpaid care work and lockdowns have slowed down the market economy, but unpaid care work has gone into hyperdrive. So also women make up 70% of the health and social care workforce, providing essential services for 5 billion people around the world. And these jobs are essential for the pandemic response, which we know, but they are grossly undervalued and underpaid, putting these women at risk of being exposed to the virus. There's ample evidence that this economic insecurity and poverty within the family produces stress, and that's in turn correlated with domestic violence, and we've just heard about that. Since the outbreak of COVID-19, all types of violence against women and girls, particularly domestic violence, has intensified. Up to a 33% increase in intimate partner violence has been reported in some countries. So it's against this very dire backdrop that we consider how women's access to justice has been affected. Um, as we've learned from the task force on justice, more than 5 billion people, that's two thirds of the world's population, lack meaningful access to justice. And we all know this burden of injustice is not randomly distributed among people. The justice gap is really a reflection of structural inequalities and a contributor to those inequalities. The poorest women face the highest barriers to justice. So again, how is this affected access to justice? The pandemic has diverted resources away from the justice sector, sorry, uh, towards immediate public health measures. So institutions and services such as courts, hotlines, crisis centers, legal aid clinics, social welfare services were scaled back in many countries. Justice institutions have also been compelled to operate a little differently, as we all know. 
courts prioritize only exceptionally urgent cases, place restrictions on, on in-person appearances, and courts were, of course, forced to rapidly digitalize using internet and video conferencing for filing and hearing of cases. While we all see this generally as a positive thing that we move towards this digitalization, it potentially excludes a lot of women around the world, 550 million to be exact, because that's the number of women who do not have access to mobile phones. So now we're slowly returning to a new normal. How do we, what should we do to uh, tackle this disparity? Um, I think we need to consider how we build back ensuring that gender equality is of course mainstreamed and any meaningful pandemic recovery must prioritize a gender responsive and gender sensitive approach. There's a lot of ways to do this. I'm gonna highlight just three approaches that I think would be important. Eliminating legal discrimination against women by repealing discriminatory laws, which limit justice for women and adopting laws that empower women. Secondly, increase the participation of women as decision makers in the justice sector to ensure that there are key players and actors in this sector. We need women at the helm to ensure that the justice sector strategies and frameworks draw from these critical lessons that we learned during the pandemic and transformative legal empowerment can happen. And then lastly, I think we should increase the use of alternative dispute resolution and partner effectively with informal justice and justice mechanisms of indigenous and minority people to overcome of some, some of these structural barriers that women face. So um, just to end this, I just wanna briefly tell you what the Commonwealth has done so far. Uh, we've launched several pro projects, three of which I'd like to share. The first one is called Leveling the Law by 2030. The Secretariat in collaboration with UN Women, the World Bank and other institutions launched a strategy, strategy aimed at leveling the law or eliminating gender discriminatory laws. It seeks to fast track the repeal of gender discriminatory laws focusing on six specific areas. I'll tell you more about them later. Um, and the Secretariat here plans to work with member countries to address the areas identified through law reform. We've already started doing that as part of the project, a Secretariat and U UN Women jointly commissioned a consultant to undertake comprehensive mapping of the legal landscape of the Gambia to identify gaps. Uh, the Gambia and then also Rwanda opted for comprehensive reviews of their laws and have since concluded their respective legal analyses. Um, both countries are in the process of undertaking these reforms, but ironically, the finalization have been delayed by the COVID pandemic. Um, I suddenly hear uh, feedback. I hope you can all still hear me. Okay. Um, okay, so I'm going to continue with the second project. It's our human rights team. Um, I'm sorry, the guy on the iPhone, would it be possible to meet? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so um, our human rights team is a great project to increase women's political participation. We know that investing in the inclusion of women and girls in political processes and leadership directly benefits economic growth, good governance, participatory democracy, and ultimately access to justice. So this project provides trainings and specific technical assistance to member countries to increase women's pot political participation. We just had a very successful um, trip to the Caribbean um, and training on women's political participation. The human rights team also generally supports our member countries to implement human rights treaties, including treaties that support gender equality, such as the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. And then lastly, zooming a little further out, a um, little further from the law, the Secretariat launched the Commonwealth Says No More campaign uh, with the No More Foundation. And this purpose is to implement initiatives that work on prevention of domestic violence and sexual abuse as part of the wider efforts to achieve, achieve the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals. And the partnership is designed to help member countries record accurate data on the prevalence of violence, deliver grassroots projects, train community leaders, educate bystander responses, and provide awareness resources. I think I'm out of time, Paul. Thank you very much for the opportunity to share our work. Thank you, Francesca. And I just got um, a kindly reminder from our translators that uh, this is being translated in several different languages. Um, so if all of the speakers, you know, especially us native English speakers, <laughs> remember that uh, I know we all have a lot to say and we want to say it quickly, but uh, there are people desperately trying to keep up <laughs> with the fast pace. So everyone just please keep in mind that uh, this is being translated. Thanks. So I will turn it now over to the next of our panelists, Ms. Jarpa Dawuni, who is the Executive Director of the Institute for African Women in the Law. Ms. Dawuni. Hi, good morning, everyone, and thank you very much to the World Bank, to the Compact, and to the organizers for the World Justice Forum for having me here. So I'm going to try to speak 
slowly because I naturally speak very fast when I'm on Zoom. Um, by way of introduction, I'll just stick to the introduction part. So I am an associate professor of political science at Howard University in Washington, DC. And I'm also the founding director of the nonprofit organization, the Institute for African Women in Law. I'm gonna speak about that institute in one of the many hats I wear. This institute was created in 2016. And it came out of my frustration as an academic, as a scholar, as a researcher, in trying to figure out and write about women in law, because I must also say that I am a qualified lawyer, barrister in Ghana. And so I tried to merge my legal training with my political science training as an academic. And I couldn't find any data. I couldn't find any consistent research about women in law in Africa. So I created this organization as a way of doing four things. One is to engage in research, research informed by data and informed by empirical experiences of women in law across the continent of Africa. And so we've done this consistently. And I must say that within six years, I have been able to produce four books. The fourth one just went out to the publisher last week, documenting women in law, specifically women judges, but now I am moving slowly to look at the experiences of women as lawyers and women as legal academics. So what we do is that the research informs us of the gaps that exist. And when we identify those gaps, we begin to provide the training to enhance the capacity <coughs> of women in law. And once we are going on with the training, we also provide mentoring because we need to build a pipeline for the future. And lastly, we also engage in advocacy in ways in which we can promote gender equity within the institutions that women work as lawyers, judges, legal academics, and hopefully we'll move on to other areas. So those are the four key areas we've been working on. And I'll end up on this note, that within the past seven years that the Institute has existed, apart from publishing books, academic books on women judges, we also are building a comprehensive database, which we call the digital archive. Up until now, there was no consistent knowledge about women judges, women lawyers across the continent. So we are documenting those experiences. We are also producing an oral history narrative, interviewing top women judges across the continent to understand their history in order to document for the future. We are also involving men as male allies because we all know that institutional mechanisms that tend to limit women's opportunities have also been created largely by men, some men, and so we need to involve them. My simple role is if men were part of the issue or part of creating the problem, they should be part of the solution. So we are involving our good male allies in solving these problems. And so I'll end up on this note by saying, I'm looking forward to the discussion to tell you a bit more on what we've done in the area of research and to engage with your partnership. Thank you. Thanks, Jarpa. And then um, last but not least, we have one of our male allies <laughs> speaking, Mr. Ian McDougall, who is the Executive Vice President and General Counsel of LexisNexis. Ian? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, one of the disadvantages of going last on a panel of excellent speakers is all the good points have been taken already. So uh, I'll try and add something from a different uh, perspective. Um, I suppose the corporate perspective is, is one of them. Um, as a, an organization, um, Lexis has um, about 11,000 people around the world and about 3,000 of them are qualified in some way or another as, as lawyers. And so there is a deep uh, belief uh, amongst that community uh, that the rule of law is the foundation of um, a fair society for success, prosperity, uh, justice. And those four pillars are um, equality uh, before the law, um, an independent judiciary, um, uh, access to the law and access to remedy. And so you can see that equality uh, represents one of the key foundational pillars for any uh, successful society. Um, the absence of it necessarily leads to a poorer, worse off uh, uh, condition uh, for everybody. The data shows that we, we have it on our uh, website where we have been able to make uh, interesting correlations between the rule of law and a vast number of socioeconomic um, measures. 
Um, on a slightly different but related point, you know, equality, whether gender or any other, ought to be considered um, a human right by definition to be treated uh, less favorably than any other human being should be abhorrent to any right thinking member of uh, society. Um, but from the um, perspective of um, what can be done, I suppose from the corporate uh, standpoint, um, we, we have to remember that um, diversity uh, is important um, from a commercial standpoint too. Um, dive, there are many studies that show that diverse uh, teams um, are uh, more productive, are more inventive, creative, um, and are more valuable. Um, and so one of the points that I think is worth making here is when we're trying to convince people uh, around the world uh, that they should be doing this, let's not be afraid to appeal to self-interest. Uh, let's not forget that actually there are a huge number of direct benefits that come about um, when you actually implement uh, an equality uh, agenda. Um, very often we talk to people about how this is the right thing to do. And it is. Uh, but sometimes we also have to emphasize why it's important to them in their everyday lives. Um, and I think we shouldn't uh, uh, lose that. Um, how can this be influenced? Well, um, for example, um, we have a, a belief um, that we want to try to help move the rule of law agenda forward by what we call deploying our core skills. That is to take something that you are already good at and try and find ways in which you can advance the particular uh, agenda, in our case, the rule of law, and therefore um, equality. And so the, we have worked, for example, with the Law Society on um, uh, the Women in Leadership uh, uh, in Law project um, in order to um, gather data to uh, be able to, to make decisions going forward. Um, we work with the International Bar Association on a decade-long study um in uh, about women um in the law so um hopefully you can see there the the idea that i'm trying to put forward here is that the way to advance um this is um first of all to get the information together so that we know what we're talking about we know what the situation is and then come up with plans that enable us to deploy skills that we already have um as a as a community um, in order to advance um, and make make progress. Um, uh, if anyone understands this issue, especially the rule of law, it should be lawyers. We should all be trained to think in this way. Uh, but I do ask a question here. How many law colleges actually teach rule of law courses? Um, I think you'd be surprised to find how small that number is, at least from my travels around the world. There are hardly any colleges at all that devote any time to their law studies to the subject of the rule of law or to issues like the ones that we're talking about today. And I think that leads to, to change. Uh, secondly, I do think as a legal profession, uh, we need to come down from on high and uh, demystify uh, what we do um, so that it becomes more attractive to a wider variety um, of people. Uh, many are put off by the um, uh, by the reputation of law as not being something um, for them. Um, and I think we need to uh, work hard to change that. And um, I also think that um, uh, finally, um, we need to um, work harder to make sure that our message is directly applicable to everyday life, everyday people, and that we don't spend too much time just talking to people who already agree with us. Um, I, I think we need to be able to go out there with examples to show what the world looks like and how it impacts everyday life when these things are not present um, and the harm that, that it causes. Um, and so I think I've taken up enough time um, already. Um, that, that's my uh, introductory comment. Thanks very much, Ian. Yeah, I, I know when I studied law, I did not have a course on rule of law or access to justice, which I think should also be another mandatory course. Um, so let's move to, to the question phase of, of our discussion. And again, if people have any questions they want to pose, please do so in the chat. Um, I'm going to direct 
questions to different presenters um, just to avoid any awkward silences and everyone kind of staring into the screen wondering whether they should speak. But if anyone has any burning issues, please just raise your hand and, uh, and, and we can jump in. Um, so the issue of women in the legal profession, uh, I started law school 30 years ago. On the first day, the dean came in to all of the first year students and announced very um, happily that our class was 50-50 gender, 50% 50 women, 50% men, which 30 years ago was a big uh, achievement. When I looked up online this week to do a little research for this, this panel, I saw that 37% of um, active lawyers in the US are women. So 30 years ago, we had 50-50 parity in school. I think that was roughly general across law schools, but uh, there's still a big lag in, in women in the legal profession. I mean, from what I've seen from statistics, the UK and France have done considerably better than my home country of the United States. Um, uh, as Jarpa pointed out, I think finding evidence and data for Africa is particularly challenging. I, I think, you know, women suffer from similar things they do in other types of professions, you know, they're clustered at the lower ranges, there's higher rates of dropout along the career. Um, I want to direct this first to, 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 to Mrs. Boyce. What do you see as the role of the, of the, um, the compact of the working group of um, the, the Law Society of England and Wales in helping make sure that women enter the law profession and, and stay in the law profession? Ms. Boyce? Well, absolutely. So uh, before I address that question, can I can I just add my comments in relation to um, some of the comments made about uh, the teaching of law, the rule of law and access to justice and so forth? I have absolutely made it my mission um, as president, because for me, legal rights mean absolutely nothing. If you don't know what those rights are in the first place, you don't even know when those rights are being taken away. So I am absolutely wedded to the idea of increasing public legal education and in fact going as far as saying here in the United Kingdom that law should be added to the national curriculum taught in schools from the earliest opportunity possible. Um, but to, to address the question, uh, there are still many issues needing to be tackled with regards to gender balance uh, in the justice system here. Um, and, in, and in the interest of time, I will focus on the gender balance within the legal profession. So although women make up some 61% or 63% of new entrants, uh, solicitors coming into the profession, 52% of practicing solicitors are female, according to the Solicitors Regulation Authority, but only 31% of partners in private practice are female. Women are still significantly underrepresented in senior roles in the solicitor profession, but not just only in the solicitor profession, but in, because uh, uh, we're not a fused profession uh, here. Um, of course, we've got the barrister profession and indeed in the judiciary. So the same problems exist in uh, the judicial uh, uh, profession and in the barrister profession. So the Law Society has found uh, signs of progress in the last four years with, for example, some law firms analysing and publishing information on the gender pay gap in greater detail, as well as planning action to address the underlying causes of the underrepresentation of women at senior levels. But of course, there is still work to be done. For one, women still face traditional gender roles and stereotypes in the workplace. They are uh, shared social and cultural expectations about a woman, uh, how she should behave on account of her gender. For example, women feel that they are having to work harder to reach the same level of recognition, promotion and remuneration as their male counterparts. Yet questioning uh, gender inequalities can carry certain risk, ranging from being labelled as difficult to harassment and dismissal. Another issue facing women in the workplace is a male orientated inflexible working day. Women solicitors are more likely to take on extra caring responsibilities than men. And this means that some women have to change their working hours. And while many are supported to, to do so and welcome that support, it can still have longer term implications for their career progression. And for some, it may even deter them from entering the legal profession at all, or coming back to the profession once they have uh, started their family. So 
there needs to be a, a change in the mindset which penalizes those who have career breaks either to start a family, take on caring responsibilities or other personal choices. Furthermore, unlike their male colleagues, female lawyers are often challenged by their clients and employers about the level of fees they charge and face requests for a reduction of fees on account of their gender. And women in all jurisdictions reported that it appears more acceptable for men to request greater financial recognition for their work, but women are perceived as aggressive when they do so. There is also a serious lack of transparency about remuneration rates and bonuses across all regions. So these are all issues that we must look to improve, for example, by promoting recruitment and promotion processes that do not adversely impact women, as well as by promoting networking opportunities for women and adapting a zero tolerance approach to sexual harassment. And that is what we at the Law Society have been doing. And indeed, uh, as president, using this platform to highlight those issues that I've spoken about and the impact uh, that they have on the career progression of women. Um, and it, when you intersect some of the other characteristics into uh, gender, how those barriers are sometimes even more entrenched um, and those in inequalities even greater. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um... Ms. Couturier, would you like to follow up with maybe some insight into how you might see the, the working group addressing some of these issues in addition to what you've done at the Paris Bar Association? Yes, thank you. Um, actually, I, I completely share uh, what Stephanie just said um, about the balance between women and men in our professions. Uh, I think we need more, we, we need more education. Uh, we need more training um, in order to have better habits uh, and another state of mind in our professions, in our legal professions. Uh, in France, we have almost the same balance. Uh, I mean that we have uh, many more women being lawyers. Uh, I think at the Paris Bar, it may be 60% uh, versus 40%, I think, almost. Uh, but uh, women can't uh, get to, to, to the higher places in the law firms. Uh, so that, that's the, the, the problem, what, what we call it here the, the glass ceiling, actually, uh, which we can't uh, expose. So th that's really a problem. I think that maybe um, the solution may be uh, with the clients, uh, because we have a, a very demanding legal professions uh, and, and young uh, lawyers in France uh, are tempted to go in-house. Uh, we, we don't have this status in France, but uh, many of our long uh, of our young young colleagues uh, leave uh, the profession to go in-house, to go uh, in uh, societies uh, in order to get a better conciliation between professional life. Uh, and professional life. So that's really a pity to, to, to lose uh, the, those talents. So we have a, a great work to, 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 to do with that. Uh, and I think that maybe we should involve more uh, young men. Uh, and here in Paris, we had a, an initiative. We, we got a longer uh, patern paternity leave. Uh, because we always talk about maternity leave, but we have to talk to, about paternity leave and maybe uh, oblige young men to, to, to take this leave uh, in order to get some equality. Uh, that's it for the moment. And then we, we can talk also about uh, access to law again and again. Thank you very much. And, and I see we've had one question pop in, which is kind of along the lines of this discussion about, you know, how we utilize male allies and the role of, of male men in the profession um, to address this uh, gender imbalance. So now I'm going to turn it over to, to Ian, maybe for some insight from his private perspective. Well, um, if I could uh, just um, uh, uh, comment, first of all, on uh, something that was just being spoken about uh, there, which is the the way that the legal professions traditionally uh, approached uh, uh, the attitude uh, uh, of women. And I think that there is um, an inbuilt um, bias uh, against um, women because the um, way that the profession charges is through the so-called billable hour. 
predominantly. And, and what that means is that traditionally, partners were selected from those people who were able to crunch out massive amounts of billable hours. Yeah, and that was the basis upon which they were they were selected to be partners. And it strikes me that that in itself is a discriminatory um, method by which you appoint partners. And hopefully at some point in the future, I, I'm a bit of a stuck record on this subject, but uh, hopefully at some point in the future, the legal profession will uh, evolve to start charging for value and not for time. And I, I think that uh, when it does that, there'll, there'll be a great deal more um, opportunity for, uh, for um, a diverse uh, number of people. I would also say that across many um, parts of uh, Europe, there is a discriminatory attitude towards in-house counsel. So for example, in many jurisdictions across Europe and some other parts of the world, in-house counsel do not have the same level of legal privilege that, um, that um, external lawyers have. Um, there's literally no reason at all why that should be the case. Um, and because um, more women leave law firms than men because of the, uh, the number of hours that they're forced to work and therefore they get better work-life balance in in-house um, uh, environments, it strikes me that that's also uh, discriminatory um, in its impact. Um, and I would uh, uh, um, ask that that, that, be, uh, that be considered. Um, but the other thing that um, I would say is that it's very important for the working group, in my view, uh, to do two things. One, which is to obviously collect um, verifiable data, um, which is always uh, important and which helps us to make uh, decisions and to see what the world actually really looks like. But secondly, to come up with a plan of um, publicity and public relations um, of campaigning uh, to change this because the one thing that we don't want is another report that a lot of people spend a lot of time on and ends up sitting on a shelf somewhere uh, never looked at and having no impact on anything and so I think that when working groups like this are formed when um, reports like this are produced a crucial element of any such report is so what are we going to do about it now we've done it um, and that's what I would um, say is, is an important thing to be considered. Thanks very much, Ian. My, my colleague Lawrence and I from, from the World Bank, you know, we, we work with economists all day long and I used to work in public sector reform. And I mean, one of the interesting things I think about the legal profession is we always consider ourselves so incredibly unique that nothing else applies to us. But, um, you know, so much of what has been said, I, I think you can say in so many other sectors, whether it's engineering, um, or tech um, or entrepreneurship, you know, the same kind of obstacles face women in the legal profession as others. And maybe there's some way the World Bank can play in kind of bridging some of that knowledge of what's worked in other sectors. Um, uh, Ms. Dawuni, um, I imagine that these gender imbalances are even worse when it comes to um, the women becoming judges and, and maybe even more so in Africa. Could you maybe share some of your experience with us? Thank you, Paul. So this is where I'm going to shock everyone. And I'm sure people are going to be asking, are you sure of what you're saying? Because I was asked that question about six or seven years ago in The Hague when I presented my research that showed that um, at the ICC, the International Criminal Court, African women had been the highest represented. Um, European men, so you know, the world group had had the highest male, but the lowest women at that time. And Africa had had the highest women almost equitable to men. And somebody asked me, are you sure of your data? And I said, just go down to the ICC, ask the registrar for the data that should solve the problem for you. So why am I saying this? I am not saying this to say that African women are doing better. Yes, they are. It's not about, it's not a competition, but this is also the idea of what we don't know about sometimes about this place called Africa, which we know is not a country and that this is a vast continent and so many things happening across it that it's not always easy to measure. And that brings me to the point about the need for research and the need for data. Because as we all know, if you can't measure something, you can't fix it. Now, I'm not going to say that everything is lovely across the continent of Africa for women in law, but based on research that I have done, we produced a, an article in 2015 that showed that across the continent at that time, over 
15 countries had had women as chief justices in common law countries and as heads or presidents of constitutional courts in civil law countries. Nobody knows about this. And since that article was published in 2015, more women have been appointed as chief justices in Kenya, in Ethiopia, and other places. Now, when we come into the women in the legal profession at the bar or the bank, uh, sorry, at the bar, um, the Institute is currently doing a four nation study looking specifically at women in leadership. And apart from that, the Institute <coughs> has also done what we call the gender scorecard. And we have chronicled about 20 of the top law firms across the continent of Africa. And by that, we're looking at the minimum of 30 people in the call, in the, in the, in the firm. And what we found surprisingly is that in the top law firms across Africa, there is gender parity, not just in numbers at the associate level, but that women are partners at equal levels as men in these law firms. And some of these law firms have had women as managing partners. But people don't know this because once again, if you don't show the data, we will just think that Africa presents the worst case of gender equality. Now, what are some of the reasons accounting for these numbers? I can go into those, but I'll leave it for Q&A if it comes up. But what I want to say, I, I personally have done interviews over eight con countries across the continent. One thing I have heard consistently about, I mostly interview women, but I also talk to the men. One of the top law firms in Ghana, the managing partner at that time told me, the women do the hard work and they make me shine. Another one said, the women are very diligent. They are attentive to detail and clients like to listen to them because they bring empathy. Those are two men, so call them male allies. But it also brings up the issue of men who are allies, who see the potential in women, promoting them to partners, sometimes also promoting them to managing partners. These men should speak up and speak out so that other men can understand that in your law firms, you have women who are equally qualified, sometimes more qualified, and that you shouldn't just use them within your firm, but you should let the rest of the legal profession know that these women are there, they are gems, and if we find them, we have to amplify the work they do. So once again, there's a lot of research that we're doing, especially in terms of women in leadership positions. Um, we, you know, we're doing a four nation um, study now funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And we're going to be seeing interesting outcomes in women's progression towards leadership. Having given you the glorious picture of the great things suffering across the continent, I must say that it is not all rosy. Just as Stephanie talked about, and just as um, Ms. Gautier talked about, there are still many problems that women face as lawyers within law firms. All the stuff of sexual harassment, um, discriminatory pay, in gender um, in equity in pay, issues of promotion do exist. And so we need to do more. And that is where I'll end up by saying that the work that the compact is doing is important. One, that we're going to also engage in cross national study. What's the good stuff happening across the continent and how can we learn that in other jurisdictions? It's not always bad things coming out of the continent, but the most important thing is that how can we also support women in different jurisdictions in order to ensure that gender equity is not just based on regions, it's not just based on countries, but that it is indeed a global affair and that we can support each other transnationally. So I'll end up on that note. Thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Pretorius, would you like to speak a little bit on the experience with uh, the Commonwealth? Yes, thank you very much, Paul. Um, I'm just gonna build on what everyone said. Um, it's been some really great points made. I'm specifically gonna try and answer the question in the chat, which is, how can we involve our male champions a little more. Um, I worked as a lawyer in both South Africa and in the United States, uh, two very different experiences, but unfortunately also pretty similar with regard to gender inequality. Um, and I think an answer to the question is how, how can we get our male allies to help more is we need to change the environment at the top. Um, we need to involve the leaders of law firms, which we've heard now from, from the speakers, is overwhelmingly men and we 
you know, what we're advocating for is a systems change. So in changing a systems, there are many roles that shepherd the change. One of them is for male allies and having champions can change a culture and create legitimacy for women in the profession. And then I wanna say we need to empower women to bring about change and become leaders in the organization. But what's important here, um, and it's something I've experienced and seen happen, is that we shouldn't have token women in leadership positions. Um, I've witnessed situations where women were just promoted to avoid difficult conversation, conversations around male dominance in the workplace, but the woman had no real power around the table. So it's one thing to say, get the leaders at the top, get the woman at the top, but create an environment where women can thrive at the top. And that, I mean, a lot of us have touched on this, you know, the inflexible working hours, the billable hours, pay gap, all of these things. Um, create an environment where women can thrive at the top. You also need to give women a voice at the top. Um, if you promote a woman to a senior position, but most decisions are still made on the golf course, that's not real change. Um, we really need to think about the environment we create. Um, women in leadership positions should be fully empowered to bring about the change that they want. Um, then with addressing the pay gap, I, I just wanted to share an idea. Um, I know someone who, to address the pay gap, said they're not going to make salaries negotiable anymore. So um, let the system address it for the woman. It's harder for me as a woman to, to fight for a higher salary. It's, it's just a fact. I really struggle with it. Um, and this male ally actually decided that there's just no more negotiation for men or women. So that levels the playing field. People at the top can do that. Um, and then I just wanted to totally support Ian. I think billable hours are terrible and it disincentivizes us to be efficient. I remember being very frustrated when I started as a lawyer because I can't learn to do things more efficiently because that cuts down my billable hours, um, but that cuts into my, my everyday life. Yeah, so just a couple of thoughts from my side. Thanks, Paul. Thanks very much, Francisco. Yeah. I, I, I'm a big opponent of billable hours as well for, for, for a number of different reasons. Um, We've already started uh, kind of touching on some of the other issues that I think are, are important that we wanted to raise um, for discussion and, and, and being cognizant of, of the time. You know, we always over plan with questions to avoid <laughs> awkward silences, but it, I think this is rarely a problem when you put groups of lawyers and judges together. Um, so I, I want to kind of blend into kind of two of the next two topics and, and let uh, the discussants choose which one they, they want to go into. So we've already discussed a little bit about the role of research and data and uh, analysis and evidence and um, what's needed. And I would add that I, I think gender justice has been probably one of the more studied of, uh, of issues. And I mean, Ian mentioned kind of the reports that go on shelves. So on the one hand, I feel like there's there's been a fair amount of attention. I mean, we still lack data like we do in all, all aspects of, of the justice sector, but it would be good interest, interesting to hear a bit more from the speakers about, you know, what, what do we still don't know and what do we think we really need to know? I mean, what are the priorities when it comes to, to, to data and evidence? And the second is around the role of your organizations in addressing legal discrimination against women. You know, the um, Women Business and the Law at the World Bank is tracking this on a yearly basis. And although there have been dramatic reforms since the 1970s, there's still quite a way to go. I mean, Sub-Saharan Africa being actually one of the biggest reformers over the last 30 or 40 years or so. But I found the statistic on their website that still globally women enjoy only three quarters of the legal rights that men do. So there's some sticky areas that not, have not uh, been overcome. So I will let each of you choose which or both if you want to, to address. But maybe since um, Mr. Wuni was the first one to raise the issue of, of the role of research and data, maybe we can start with, with, with you. Jarpa, please. Thank you, Paul. So I, I think I'll limit my response to what I call the, the three Ds. And you started at some what? One, data. Like I've mentioned to you in some of the data based on research that I have done, uh, th there's still so much to be done. I'm focusing on the continent and as you know, it's huge. So I cannot even lay myself to be an expert in the total, the, the whole continent. But based on the research I have done, based on discussions and conversations among the network that I know, it's frustrating for me as a scholar to be writing and say most of, many of, several. I don't want to do that because that's just sometimes over generalization. 
So we need to be able to collect that data, whether quantitative or qualitative, clean the data and know that it is really representing what we're talking about. Quantitative data may tell us, yes, absolutely. There is a feminization of the legal profession in, across the continent like anywhere else. Women are increasingly going to law school, graduating and graduating top of their class. But what does it mean to have the numbers? Then we can go into the qualitative to really understand those experiences. The second D is diversity. And this goes beyond the continent of Africa. So this is important for the compact. If we are looking to really dig in and understand the experiences of women in law, the legal profession, where they are, what their experiences are, how they can contribute to the rule of law, they have always been contributing, how they can contribute to access to justice for other women, the importance of diversity should be critical. In that case, I would say, let's leave no woman behind. When we're talking about women within the legal professions, let's focus globally and understand the different experiences, looking at the different contexts, the historical experiences, and most importantly, I'll throw in the word for those who understand intersectionality, very important. We shouldn't transport women's experiences from one region to the other one because it will not always work. The last D, is development and development of capacity. Have you ever been in an airplane before it takes off? One of the many things you hear is when the oxygen max drops, what do you do? Yourself first before you help the next person. And it's important that we are looking to strengthen and develop the capacity of women in law, the legal profession themselves, so they can in turn help other women who are seeking access to justice. And so what do we mean by this? That we have to provide the training, we have to provide the capacity, but also we need to know that when we're talking about women, they are not a monolithic group. Some women understand the gendered aspects of the profession, the ways in which society and institutions are gendered and affect them. Others don't or think there's no problem. And so until we put on that gendered lens for men and women, to understand the ways in which historically the legal profession was and still is a male institution until women can also help to deconstruct those gendered norms, masculine norms, we will continue to have challenges. For example, the, what um, Francisca mentioned, how do women negotiate for pay increase? How do they negotiate for better terms of working? So these are the issues that end up on this note that in as much as we are looking to address the systemic hierarchies that prevent women or limit women's opportunities within the profession, rising within the profession, we also have to focus on developing their capacity and together those can also help. I'm not laying the blame on women. I'm just saying once again, based on research, that it has to be a holistic approach. It has to be a global approach and it has to be one based on diversity and inclusion. Thanks. Thank you so much, Sharpa. Um, you, you raised so many interesting points, and I'm going to throw one one more in there. It's kind of the role of qualitative data, because you know we get really focused on quantitative data, and we see this in other sectors where it's all about you know numbers and percentages. And I feel like the the quantitative tells us you know what the problem is, and the qualitative helps us understand you know why it's a problem. And I think uh, Ms. Couturier, you had mentioned qualitative data in one of your remarks, if I remember correctly. But if not, I'm going to turn to you anyway to 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 please give us your perspective. Thank you. Yes, um, actually, I. Th we, we, we talked very much about the members of the legal community um, and we uh, we talked about gender justice from that point of view, but maybe we should take an, another point of view uh, regarding the, the, the citizens uh, and the, the women and men citizens. And maybe we can talk about the inequality, uh, the gender inequality uh, regarding access to law, uh, which was uh, uh, our subject uh, at the beginning. Um, and from this point of view, I think that we need to put in place uh, measures uh, that are adapted to the specific needs uh, of women and train professionals accordingly, uh, especially lawyers, uh, so that their services are uh, efficient. I think that for that, we have to um, uh, 
to, to have some network and to, to, to make our networks work together. Uh, for example, the, the, the Paris Bar works together with the Fondation des Femmes, uh, the, the Women Foundation, uh, we, we, which have a, a, a juridic force uh, against the domestic violence as well as a, a gender-based discrimination. Uh, the legal strong point of the Fondation des Femmes is represented by the pro bono lawyers of the Paris Bar. Uh, to those specific needs. Um, and I think that th this will be um, virtuous uh, also for the profession uh, if we open our minds uh, to the women needs in society and, and legal needs of women in society. Thank you, thank you so much. Um... Mr. McDougall, do you want to jump in here and maybe you can talk yeah, a little yeah. bit? I mean, you pick which which one you want to answer, but well, I think I was going to also uh, your, the information you've been given on kind of the addressing discriminatory legislation. Yeah, well, I mean, I was actually going to just uh, carry on with uh, some of the points that have just been discussed because I want to make one point which I hope is uh, very straightforward and one point which I'm sure will be much more controversial. So uh, that's going to be the fun one. Um, the, the simple point I want to make is I think um, we could do with a lot more collaboration amongst the various professional bodies um, uh, around the world. Um, what we don't want to do is to keep overlapping effort. I think if the international associations and various societies and bodies around the world could actually coordinate their efforts um, a, a bit better, um, I think there may be uh, strength in that uh, in that volume, shall I say. Uh, to turn to um, now uh, what I think is going to be a more controversial um, point, which is that, um, uh, and I'm really picking up on a point that was just, just made just, just before uh, me uh, talking now, which is about the focus on who we're trying to help um, here. Um, and what I mean um, in, in my particular context is um, traditionally the law societies, um, professional associations, etc., are there to represent the legal community, the legal profession. And that's fine, but that has a um, potential to become protectionist, to um, think about things in the context of how the legal profession can do well by protecting itself at the same time. So um, perhaps if we were to become more um, actually what you might call in industry terms, customer centric, um, instead of professional centric, um, that might help. Let, let me give you a, an example. Um, we know at the moment that women are far less likely to go and seek uh, legal advisor help than men are. Um, the result is that they are basically therefore excluded from the justice system to a higher degree than men are. Um, well, what does that mean? How would someone approach the justice system um, on their own? They certainly can't use the rules of the court. They're practically impenetrable. Um, nobody but a lawyer trained in law can read the rules of the court and make any sense of them. What about if we were to rewrite the rules of the court so that a lawyer wasn't actually even needed? Now, um, I'm sure the legal profession would kind of recoil in horror at such a thing. But um, my suggestion is that there is a lot that could be done to give people a better way into the justice system that did not require lawyers and lawyers could help with that. Now, my view is that the legal profession wouldn't have anything to fear if they are focused on quality and value added service um, rather than trying to protect um, uh, the, the legal industry. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example of this, um, if I may. Um, so a long time ago now, uh, there was a reform of the um, High Court procedure in the UK but done by Lord Wolfe. Um, and these were known as the Wolf reforms. And one of the things that um, Lord Wolf said was he wanted to de-jargonize um, uh, the, um, uh, the rules of the court. So we ended up with a situation like this, which is a, um, a without prejudice letter sent with the intention of um, coming to uh, an agreement was known in the jargon as a Calderbank letter at the time. 
And so this is how successfully Lord Wolfe's reforms de-jargonized it. It's now known as a Part 36 offer. Um, and um, I'm sure when you say that to non-lawyers, that sounds as ludicrous as it really is. Right? Now, nobody knows what a Part 36 offer is except a lawyer. Trying to read how to do a Part 36 offer is practically impossible unless you are legally trained. And these are the examples of where we can, as a profession, actually help people, yeah, um, uh, uh, seemingly to the detriment of lawyers, because now suddenly people you might think won't want to go to a lawyer. But I don't believe that's the case. I believe that what will happen is that it creates an easier way to enter the justice system and that in the end benefits the legal profession. So that's just an example, um, I think, of how uh, the focus could be switched to becoming more what we would call customer centric instead of legal profession centric. So you've moved us very quickly to kind of our the last <laughs> question of, of the day. But um, before doing that, um, please, uh, Francisca, do you want to kind of jump in on uh, the two earlier questions? Yes, happy to. I, I, I will um, talk a little bit about the second one, um, a little more around what the Commonwealth is doing, uh, our organization is doing, and specifically addressing gender discriminatory legislation. This is something that I mentioned earlier, and I said we focus on six specific areas to eliminate gender discriminatory legislation, and I think maybe these might provide some useful ideas for the working group too. Um, so the project focuses on comprehensive reforms that's repealing discriminatory laws that directly and indirectly impact women and girls. It also looks at promoting women's economic empowerment by repealing laws that undermine equal pay, recognition of unpaid care work, protection of domestic workers, parental leave and freedom of choice of employment. And then it looks at eliminating harmful and discriminatory minimum age of marriage provisions, promote 18 years as the minimum age of mar marriage, equalize the age of marriage between women and men, and eliminate related exceptions as appropriate. It looks at ending gender discrimin discrimination in nation nationality laws, so uphold women's rights to equality and nationality and citizenship laws. It look, also looks at addressing discriminatory rape laws, revised provisions that exempt perpetrators from rape charter, charges if they marry the survivor. And then lastly, uh, the promoting equality in family relations, repeal gender discriminatory personal status laws. Um, so yeah, the, this is very broad focus of our work on repealing these discriminatory legislation. Um, but of course, I also want to emphasize that this is not an isolated exercise. Merely repealing discriminatory laws will not change social policies or political will. Um, of course, lo laws won't achieve their intended effect if they are in strong conflict with the prevailing norms. So we're also doing some work to address that. And that's the women's political participation that I've mentioned and the Commonwealth says no more. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit of, of our work and, and what we're doing. But uh, I'm, I'm also happy to jump into this, this customer-centric centric approach. Uh, but Paul, I, I, I'm fine to also stop here and then we can move there. Why don't Whatever we stop want. here? Okay. Yeah, why don't we stop here and give Miss Boyce uh, a chance and then we'll kind of do a last round where we're gonna throw in the people-centered uh, question as well. So uh, Miss Boyce, please. Firstly, can I say uh, my apologies? I'm terribly distracted uh, by uh, today. Uh, well, the next four days, in fact, is our Platinum Jubilee weekend. And uh, I'm terribly distracted by the pageantry on the TV. But nevertheless, um, some interesting comments um, around customer centric services that I'm sh uh, I know we'll come back to. But in terms of the question, <coughs> so on the topic of uh, law societies, uh, you know, bar associations and things that we can do, there really is plenty for and lots that we can and should be doing to support uh, gender justice. And of course, um, you know, uh, we should all be working with uh, our firms, businesses, uh, organisations to explain what the issues are affecting gender balance and pushing for those businesses, firms to modernise, adapt, pr adopt practices which will close the gap. But since we launched the Women uh, in Law Pledge in the United Kingdom or in England and Wales in 2019, firms have committed to the pledge, have been putting flexible working policies in place and setting targets for greater gender balance at senior levels, as well as creating transparency around promotion pathways uh, for women 
Um, so women can see beyond that ceiling, if you like. So we spoke briefly about COVID and COVID, of course, has brought uh, a, a growing acceptance around flexible uh, and remote working. Um, and then, you know, here we saw overnight uh, the switch to remote working, um, which demonstrated that organizations have the technology and the infrastructure to allow flexible working, you know, uh, whilst remaining profitable. And of course, that was something that, you know, for years, uh, businesses had been saying couldn't happen, shouldn't happen. So it's absolutely essential that we build on this opportunity um, by implementing hybrid working uh, ways, which is by far the most popular response given in a poll that women, uh, our Women Lawyers Division recently carried out. Um, uh, asking members what needed to be overcome in the profession or what bias needed to be overcome. So we're seeing more uh, businesses, firms are now, now open to flexible working arrangements and those that embrace uh, this opportunity to change how work will be regarded with increased employee retention, enhanced productivity and greater diversity at senior levels. It's critical that we ensure that women don't suffer as a result of an inadvertent creation of a two-tier system where those who choose to be in the office are given preferential treatment over those who choose to work at home. So great progress has been made with demonstrable results in terms of gender balance, but there is so much more to be done. Um, and as Lady Hale uh, put it, uh, the former UK Supreme Court judge, Although the battleground has shifted, the battle has not yet won. So thank you. So thank you very much. And now all of us that do not live in monarchies are very jealous that we don't have Jubilee celebrations. <laughs> so we're all a little bit sad in this room right now, but we will recover. So we have 15 minutes or a little less than 15 minutes remaining. So I, I want to turn to kind of the final topic. And this has been a really big issue for those of us that have been here and participating since the week started around people-centered justice. And I have to say, from my personal experience as a lawyer, when I moved to Washington, DC, I did a little bit of pro bono in family court, and I found very little about our court system to be in any way people-centered or people-friendly. The language, the processes, the, the treatment, the demeanor, um, it's all very intimidating and complicated and, and difficult. Um, to, 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 to navigate and, you know, let's be honest, the, the law profession has not always had the best reputation when it comes to fixing these things. You know, we, we are unique, we are special, we can't be monitored, we can't be evaluated. Um, we're not like other public services, though we really kind of are. Um, so I'd be really interested to hear from each one of you, where do you see yourselves and your organization sitting in promoting the people-centered approach to access to justice. So I'm trying to not be biased in terms of where people go in order, but I'm gonna start with uh, Francisco because I think you've been at the end of the last two questions. So please, why don't you kick us off? Thank you, Paul. Um, yeah, it's been, a, I, I unfortunately didn't have a chance to, to join some of the sessions this week, but um, it's been a big discussion at the Commonwealth as well. How, how do we shift our focus? How do we move from you know, how, how do we change the justice system with the justice seekers and the justice users in mind, as opposed to just the justice providers being all of us lawyers and judges, right? Um, and I think this people-centered approach is especially important as we recover from the pandemic and as we shift towards digitalization of justice systems. Um, I think using technology just for the sake of it can be exacerbating inequalities. Um, as we mentioned earlier, courts were forced to rapidly, rapidly digitalize during the pandemic. And yes, this is generally a positive thing. It allows us more flexibility. It also potentially excludes a lot of people who do not have access to technology. So if the focus is really people-centered, the solution will ensure that the technology increases access to justice. Um, so, for example, this could begin with a basic commitment to ensure that every woman has access to a mobile phone as a means of communicating and receiving information. Technology should really be a means to an end. If we have a people-centered focus, the end should be access to justice. Um, I also wanted to just touch on this customer-centric approach, your people-centered justice, customer-centric approach. Uh, when I was a lawyer in the US, 
my one colleague was so frustrated by the fact that it's not customer centric and it's such an opaque way of practicing law uh, that she now has a personal goal of making herself useless in the next 10 years. So she says if she can do her job perfectly well and she can help people understand the law, she should be out of a job in 10 years time. So Ian, just touching on your point, I think it is a difficult topic to talk about, but um, a, an important one. Thanks, Paul. My personal goal is to abolish the distinction between criminal and civil cases so that all family law cases go under one case, but that will never happen. Um, uh, Ms. Boyce, why don't, why don't we turn to you, please? Well, absolutely. I mean, I spoke earlier about, um, you know, the need, the ambition to have law taught in schools. But, you know, um, and, but I hop back to a recent uh, meeting I had with um, an ex-minister um, and, and he spoke of, he put it like this, and he said, you know, the way uh, we provide legal services is changing, is going to change. And in, and in fact, we've seen this with our new entrants coming into the profession in terms of the way they practice, in terms of the areas of practice, you know, more around cybersecurity, more around tech. They uh, don't want to uh, be in that traditional uh, uh, private practice model, more so wanting to venture out on their own or, or work in uh, startup, uh, startup companies. But he put it like this, and what he said was, is that he said, when was the last time, when you're thinking about purchasing insurance for your car, for your home, when was the last time you went to an insurance broker? He says, well, and of course I had to think about it. And he said, well, you didn't you went online. He said, you know, or if you think about when you booked a holiday, when was the last time you went into um, a travel agent, sat in the, 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 uh, in the agent's uh, office and booked a holiday? He said, you know, the way we purchase things, um, and indeed here, the way we've seen, the way we interact with banking has absolutely changed. So he said, you know, um, that technology, as we've already uh, suggested, is going to hasten the way we provide legal services. And we've seen a number of uh, innovative solutions, ideas come up uh, here in the UK as to how the role that technology plays in that. But of course, a number of caveats, and we've seen some of that it, it play into our justice system, where, you know, for certain offences, you can do it all online, tick a box, um, and, uh, you know, it's all done for you. Um, and, and it goes back to a point that I made. So the Law Society is pushing uh, a great push towards public legal education um, because, you know, the London Legal Walk Trust put it like this. They said two thirds of the UK adult population do not know where to go to to get legal advice. They don't recognise when they have a legal dispute. Um, uh, and if they were able to recognise perhaps earlier uh, that legal dispute, it may stem some of the uh, uh, domino knock-on effect that we see around health, around housing, and some of those inequalities that we have spoken about. Um, but, you know, like everything, uh, everything has a time and a place and things are evolving. But I do, but I personally believe that absolutely public legal education is key. Uh, lawyers are going to have to adapt to the way we provide services, the way we interact with the justice system. And indeed this government, there is a big push um, to ensure uh, that there is greater access to justice. Uh, we may not always agree um, how, it, how they go about in doing that or how they get there, but uh, we, we are going to have to keep up with the times. Thank you so much. Ms. Couturier, do you want to give us a little bit of information about how you're addressing this in France or how you see this evolving through the working group? Yes. Um, actually, we have great effort to do uh, with information, with providing information and communication to citizens about uh, legal aid system. Uh, last January, we, we launched a, a survey um, and the result was that uh, about 25% of people um, just avoid justice uh, for, for financial reasons. Uh, and 50% of the people uh, we, 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 we asked for uh, just didn't know the legal aid system. 
So we, we all have, uh, I mean, the government, uh, our profession, everyone has a great effort to do in order to inform us, our fellow citizens, about those systems. Uh, regarding especially the Paris Bar, we have uh, a political will uh, to, to, to do some pro bono. Uh, many, many lawyers uh, that uh, do some pro bono uh, for vulnerable people. Um, and we have this uh, legal access department, which is uh, very, very dynamic um, uh, with many, uh, as I said, many partnerships. Um, that's what I said uh, a little earlier, uh, and that, that, that's very important for us to, to, to provide this information and this communication uh, about our legal aid service. Thank you so much. Um, Mr. McDougall, please. Yes, I was um, really wanting to jump up and down here in violent <laughs> agreement with what Stephanie was saying. Uh, um, uh, a few minutes ago. Um, I do believe that um, there is fundamental change in the legal profession coming, um, which is being um, uh, affected greatly by uh, technology. My advice to those um, uh, law societies or associations that have any kind of regulatory um, uh, um, control or impact um, is I would suggest that the, the theory should be to drive altruistic change and not to be driven by it. Um, it's always much better uh, to be in control of the way the thing develops uh, than it is to be pushed around. Um, I would uh, go back to uh, some um, changes that I feel are necessary. I've already mentioned the rules of the court, which I think should be looked at to make them more uh, user friendly. I also think it's very important that we um, again, this sounds self-interested, but investment in the court system is investment in the economy. And I think we should make that case um, uh, very strongly. Um, and um, uh, I agree again with the uh, idea of law and rule of law specifically, in, in my view, being taught in schools and, and colleges. Um, but um, I, I do think that um, there is um, a change in the way that the legal profession does its work uh, is coming. It's coming rapidly. Um, for example, we uh, go to law school and spend three, four years or so learning how to regurgitate uh, large tracts of law uh, on demand. Um, uh, what an utterly useless skill when their computer can do it far better than any human being can. Um, ultimately, I think what's going to happen is that we're going to, uh, in fact, be trained on how to um, uh, navigate the legal system rather than how to um, remember large volumes of law. Um, and that will mean, therefore, that um, uh, there will be more of a focus on customer management, on uh, leading a customer through the legal process, um, uh, and these kind of uh, skill changes, which will be uh, uh, which which will be necessary. But um, yeah, I don't really want to add very much more than that because I think Stephanie covered it uh, far better than I can. <laughs> so thank you, Mr. Oni. You have the final word, please. All right, thank, thank you, you Paul. Paul. The pressure of the final word means you have one minute. So let me end up by saying a great conversation. <laughs> Great conversations, learned so much from my co-panelists and um, looking definitely to us working together collectively. In terms of um, customer-centric approaches, I think one thing that it's going on and we need to emphasize, especially within the context of the developing economies, is the use of ADR, alternative dispute resolution mechanisms, which are to a large extent indigenous to most of these um, Spaces, you know, let me just speak once again within the context of Africa and then, of course, other places in, in Latin America and Asia, where we can use indigenous knowledge systems to help bridge that gap between lawyers and all the legalese and, as you said, all the regurgitation, which is not helping now, and to demystify the law and the lawyers, and so that the local communities can understand and they can feel safe and drawn to seeking legal expertise, especially when we're talking about women and their access to justice, it becomes really horrifying for them. I would say also that, for example, in terms of using technology, 
um, there's an organization that we, we work with called the Barefoot Law, which is based in Uganda, who are also working really hard to bring technology to the local communities. That way people feel that they can go in and get the help they need. Lastly, um, three quick points. One, that we should also bridge the gap between research and practice. And I think in said it too, we don't want to produce these beautiful reports, books, and put them on shelves. How do we translate that knowledge into context that people can understand? Let's also work to open up silos. So at the Institute, we're not just focusing on judges or lawyers, we're also looking at legal academics. How can we have conversations between these three and more in order for their work to be complementary? And lastly, context matters. We should be careful not to transport experiences in one country, one region of the world onto other. It will not work as we have seen that it hasn't worked. Let's learn from experiences of places where things have worked, which we didn't expect that they would work for whatever reason, to other places where we expected that it would work and it's not working. And that way we can have a consistent global approach that helps us to understand that all we are doing together is to fight for the common good of all humans, equality, justice, rule of law for all. Thank you. See, the best thing about the last word is everyone will remember us. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, um, for joining. Um, on behalf of the World Bank and my colleague Laurence, um, we really appreciate uh, all of this work, and we look forward to cooperating, coordinating, and, and building work together uh, long into the future. Thank you, everyone. Have a nice weekend, and have a wonderful Jubilee, please. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.